we thrive on bespoke and unique design. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Mark Bullivant. So in this episode, Mark, who is a principal at Sayota Architecture, which is based in Cape Town, he will be discussing with us a few interesting topics, including the power of imagery in winning international work and those dream projects. We talk about building a portfolio of extraordinary international work whilst being based in a youthful domestic economy, such as uh, in Cape Town in South Africa. And we talk about what it actually takes to be on a leadership team of a practice of the scale and caliber of Sayota. So Mark himself completed a Bachelor of Architecture at the University of Cape Town in 2006. He immediately joined Sayota, cutting his teeth overseeing the construction of a number of local projects. Mark quickly established himself within the practice with his all-round ability, work ethic, and leadership skills, and started climbing the ranks, culminating in promotion to senior associate in 2015 and then to principal of Sayota. He is creative, versatile and ambitious and Mark's interest in the profession and the realization of unique design solutions are apparent in his projects both locally and abroad. So Mark is the regional head if you like of or has the regional knowledge base at Seota in the US. So really interesting conversation here, which covers a lot of territory. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mark Bullivant. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Mark, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Very good, thanks. Thanks for having me. How are you? Excellent. I'm very well, thank you. I'm very good indeed. Now, absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. You're one of the directors at Seota. Um, you guys have got, I mean, just in your private residential portfolio of work, just up absolutely extraordinary homes right across um, South Africa and into other parts of uh, the continent as well. Um, and actually, you've got very diverse, a very diverse portfolio of work and one of the one of the, the premier practices in the in, in South Africa, you've been there for for what, 16 years or so? Correct. Yes, yeah, 16 years. Great. And yeah. you've, um, you've been a director, how long have you been a director for? Uh, since 2015, uh, I became one. Okay. So best part of a, best part of a decade. Yeah. Nearly there. And, and I, as I understand that the, the Sayota has really been the kind of the, the main practice, um, like you've, you've been in pretty much since you left university. Correct. I, um, during, during studies, uh, worked for a small practice here in Cape town and, uh, and my final exam, uh, Stefan saw my work and, uh, I was offered a job and, uh, so straight out of school, joined, and uh, I've never left. Amazing. For, for you, how would you describe Sayoto as, as its kind of, you know, the, its specific offering in the marketplace, or what makes you guys a unique practice? Um, I think that we, um, we create sort of environments and, and, and buildings for that, that people can really live in. I think we, we take a lot... Uh, we place a lot of emphasis, certainly, on the kind of where we come from and, and what, what Cape Town, I guess, has to offer in terms of lifestyle and, and the way to engage um, with, the, with, with the surroundings. And so we kind of try and apply that analogy to, to all of our buildings, whether it's a residence or, or, or any other kind. But that, that's, that's probably what I think is the root of, of what we, we're trying to create. And in your time since, you know, over the last 16 years, how have you seen the practice grow and shift and change? And obviously you've, you've weathered a few difficult economic storms, you know, COVID being, you know, the, the kind of most recent one. How, yeah, how have you seen the practice grow since your time there? So I, I might start at the beginning because this might take a slightly long explanation. And by the, by the beginning, I mean sort of preceding myself. So, so Stefan yeah, Stephen Anthony founded the business 
um, I think it was in uh, around 1985. Um, we're 37 years old this year, so I should be able to do that math. Maybe that's 86. Um, and uh, was primarily doing um, work here in Cape Town, um, largely in the residential space. Um, I think in the mid-90s, Greg Truen and Philip Olmsdale joined the practice and um, continued to kind of um, along that vein. And we started doing some more work throughout South Africa. Um, lots of bits and pieces, but, but certainly um, in, in, primarily in the, in the residential areas. Uh, probably early 2000s, I think, started getting some work more upcontinent, um, which I think was partly a strategic move to kind of broaden, broaden horizons. Um, mm -hmm. and, were, and, and then kind of when I joined in 2007, um, I think we had just done uh, a first project through one of the uh, Senegalese um, clients in, on Lake Geneva, which was kind of one of our first international projects. <clears throat> and so really when I joined, we were doing a lot of um, residential work, a lot of full service work here in Cape Town um, and fairly prolific um, in, in that arena. And kind of around the 2010 mark, we, we started to see um, the opportunities for sort of international work. And um, it's quite hard to explain exactly how it happened. Obviously, part of it was strategic and hopeful, but in the way it happened was certainly not, it was kind of far exceeded, I think, anything that was planned at the time. And um, that period was kind of a combination of, which seems hilarious to say in 2023, but, you know, was the emergence of online blogs and I think the shift from hard copy media into the more sort of online field. It sort of coincided with the 08 sort of economic downturns. And I think what really happened was um, there was, I think it was an Australian online publication called um, Architecture Hunter. Um, right. Featured one of our featured one of our projects, um, and off the back of that, uh, we got some traction. Um, people discovered us. We had probably fifteen years of very high quality work, beautifully photographed, um, that the world had never seen, um, and mm -hmm. it kind of got dumped on the internet. And then from there, uh, put the emergence of things like Pinterest and um, and some of these more sort of online media tools um, it really kind of pushed us in a way that we we kind of could never have, have really imagined. So at this point in my personal career, I was probably kind of three or four years in. I had been working on projects here. Um, I then had the opportunity to work on some of our first projects in, in Dubai, um, which was a, a great experience um, for me. Um, and and, and it, so there was Dubai and then around 2012, we got our first call um, from Miami for a project there, um, which was kind of the watershed moment in my career as that was um, obviously it opened us as a practice up to a, a huge market. Um, and I was kind of right place, right time, and was able to kind of, you know, run with that to some extent. Of course, I was very well supported by um, Philip Olmstahl, who's my my mentor and obviously my um, fellow principal at Sota. Um and that that opportunity really kind of started um, my path towards becoming a, a principal and shareholder in the in, in the business. Um, concurrently, Philippe was sort of in a similar position with some of our European work, and um, and so today, you know, we we're sitting having I think the last counts eighty odd cities, um, oh, sorry, eighty odd countries. I think it's uh, over one hundred and fifty cities, um, and and through that 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 kind of set us on a on a completely different path, changed our business model, opened new horizons and and we've really um been extremely fortunate to you know to be able to participate in in, in all of these um amazing projects that are kind of all over the world. Um so it's it's been a it's been a wild ride. That's amazing. How how old is the practice? It's thirty seven years old. Thirty seven years old. And um this strategic and hopeful kind of plan you had in 2010 what what did that involve did it was it kind of like you know we're going to conquer the world kind of plan or no not 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 at all i mean i think you know we we at our core we are um extremely passionate about what we do um mm -hmm. but i think at the same time we are extremely ambitious um so it was more i think you know take every opportunity that comes to the door and turn it into something you know, incredible and how can it lead to something else? But I think never in our wildest dreams did we really 
um, imagine that the um, yeah we, we imagine that it would kind of evolve to the extent that it did. So it, it, going beyond the kind of national boundaries for any business is is a real challenge, and it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, how and you know, how were you kind of making those connections? How did those kind of projects come about? Um, and I know obviously there's a there's a you know if you're working in in Europe and versus working in South Africa, there's going to be lots of different kind of code changes. How do those relationships begin to to work? And 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 how do you deal with like just the, the finance and the you know what you're charging people in different countries? How does how does that kind of all come together? Yeah, so. Um... It's quite a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, maybe I'll start with the, um, you know, how how it how it happened. I think, or oh, sorry, how do we how do we market? So I think you know, for us, like any architect, I think you're only as good as your last job. So we we certainly right. put you know put a lot of effort into our projects. I think maybe what we do incredibly well um, is that we understand the power of our imagery. And what I mean by that is the sort of cataloging and photo photographic content of our, of our project and, and obviously how we put that out into the world in a very specific and curated way. You know, we, we're very meticulous about the way in which our work is, um, is presented. And that's really at the core of our marketing. You know, we, we have a quite a big department that we, uh, that we refer to as our media department that, that spends a lot of time sort of placing that imagery and, um, and we do, and we do talk and do action. You know, some broader overall strategies, but we don't aren't doing necessarily kind of cold calling. It's really we understand the power of our imagery. How do we put that in the hands of someone who you know is a decision maker, and how do we get that seen? And and you know, I was joking a little bit about the Pinterest earlier, but you know, that that's really how our first project in in Miami happened. Is you know, one of our client's girlfriend saw or had a Pinterest page full of our images and someone phoned and we answered well and we spoke good English and we, you know, very systematized in the way that we work and our, you know, again, the curation and the sort of outward um, perception of, of us. I think immediately we overcome a lot of the hurdles of, you know, who are these guys? What is Cape Town? You know, do they have electricity there? Uh, you know, like, well, well, that's a that's a touchy subject because actually at the moment that's a sensitive <laughs> issue. But but you get what I mean. It's like people. Yeah. It's quite a leap of faith for people to kind of make that um, make that leap. Um, you know, of course, um, I think the next the next phase of that, which uh, is is obviously our our clientele, and I think we we really and that's that's kind of unique, I think, in business in terms of architecture is that. We are able, well, you are forced to create quite deeply personal relationships with a lot of your, your clients. And, and, you know, mm -hmm. talking about the way they live, it's not a, it's not a two week transaction or a six month deal. It's kind of could be, you know, five, six, you know, uh, event, a five, six year event that you kind of need to work through and overcome hurdles together. And, you know, if you come out the end of the other side in a, in a good place, which, you know, we do our best to do. You know that relationship counts for a top for a lot, and certainly if you are dealing with a sort of high-powered person, he's got high-powered friends, and if that person is willing to put stick his neck out and introduce you, I think that that carries a lot of weight. So we we certainly recognize we certainly recognize that. Um, so so that that that's really kind of you know fundamental um, to the to the what we do from a kind of. I guess a business development point of view, but it's it's not strictly that because, it, but that's that's kind of the, the core of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think um, I think the second part of your question in terms of the um, the international aspect is, you know, I touched on the ambition aspect of it. Um, you know, Cape Town and South Africa are home, and we think there's no city quite like Cape Town in the world, but it is a tiny little city, and to kind of fulfil. Um, our, our ambitions and, and kind of hopes and, and a potential in terms of what I think we can actually, you know, deliver as a practice. It's simply not big enough. I mean, in South Africa, there are two other principal cities, which, which generate some, some, some work, but, um, even, even sort of tapping into those, it, it wasn't enough. So, you know, that was, that was kind of part of the, the push, I guess, in terms of being able to, um, to operate in a more kind of global global sense. Um, the other thing, from a purely pragmatic business point of view, is um, the uh, 
the the currency and you know this South African rand um, and the benefit of it, the you know the cost of living in Cape Town is probably more affordable for the quality of life that you get you know anywhere in the world. I think that backed up yeah. with the fact that we have access to quite very talented um, people who come out of um, great architecture schools and are very good at what they do. Um, our service offering to an international level is is very appealing. Um, and of mm-hmm. course, for us as a business to be able to um, to kind of leverage foreign currency um, is also or is also um, a great benefit to us and something that we yeah. that we tried to do. I think we didn't know all of this going in, and you know, I think we've learned a lot of it as we as we've kind of gone through it. So, so those are obviously at some point you realize, hey, we're we doing this, and wow, this is actually the potential, and so maybe we need to put more into yeah. that. Um, so that so that was important. That was important to us. Then, then I think, um, you know, what I think our, we're also understanding what our core offering is in terms of us compared to uh, others is I think is our, is our design skills. Um, and with this international work linked to your question about how do you evaluate a code that you don't know in a foreign currency and how do you navigate, um, you know, all of those hurdles and the distance and, and you know, all of those things is, um, we also um, recognized working on our local work here that doing kind of full service offering and, and South Africa is quite an extreme example because as we've kind of learned we're now engaging in these foreign markets is uh, for us to do a full service offering here in, in locally, um, a lot falls on the architect's plate and you just get mm-hmm. absolutely murdered on your fees in that final phase of kind of site observation or construction administration as we as we call it here. So as a as a business, we also recognize that, you know, we were just, you know, all the great work we had done up until that point just basically left the door because you're beholden to every delay, you're beholden to every setback and uh, we've also learned, you know, engaging these foreign markets of, you know, a lot of a lot of the international model is that, you know, that service is offered as an hourly rate, which is a good model because at least you, you insulate it somewhat. But um, but we strategically also wanted to maybe um, recognizing that we didn't have boots on the ground in these foreign markets, that that was actually something as a business that we wanted to move away from somewhat um, and rather focus on the design. And so we've really built a business model around those parameters of where we we focus on the kind of call it first 50 percent of a of an arctic scope um in what in the south african terms is deemed design development um and and then we team up with a local practice or the the client will appoint a local practice who would um who would oversee the the permitting because obviously we, we can't have licenses for every city that we're working in um, and then sure. they would also oversee the kind of construction phases of the of the project. And it's been actually, you know, like lots of questions about, you know, how do you manage those egos around the table? Um, how does it work practically? Um, and it's not a it's not a standoff relationship. You know, we 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 really um, work very well and closely with those local architects, and we really appreciate what they what they do. So it's become a a really interesting aspect of, of what we do. And I mean, I've made, you know, wonderful friends with a lot of those architects in that position. And I think as long as the, the understanding of what we each bring to the table is clearly understood and defined, it's a, it's a really, um, it's actually a really powerful um, relationship. So I think, you know, the, we never, we, and I've also touched on our, <laughs> our systems. And I think when, when, when what you do and, and 97% of our work is this international model these days is, I mean, you know, when, when all of that work is not local to where you are, um, we, we, we've learned early on what are the right questions to ask. We would never go into a foreign place and pretend to understand, you know, how it works or what it works. But evaluating a kind of zoning code, every zoning code in the world is obsessed with the same things. And you know what to ask. How is height calculated? How is it based done? How, what's the basement definite? You know, all of the, all of the key points. So, so that stuff's actually pretty, that stuff's pretty easy. I think. Some of the learning has been in in some of the construction systems and things, you know, particularly like in the U.S., for example, um, you know, Miami has to contend with hurricanes, so that's a very kind of concrete focused construction which we are com- which we are accustomed to here. Whereas on the West Coast, it's all about the seismic, so it's about the weight, and then it becomes lightweight. Yeah. So, so that that 
those sort of things are, are more complex to um, to navigate. But I think with time and with experience, we've we've learned that. And of course, we you know we we've got support around the table in terms of these um, local um, local experts who who we we able to kind of ask those questions of. Like, well, I guess as well, you know, as as your kind of portfolio internationally expands, that's a unique. Um, um, base of knowledge in and of itself that you're getting these kind of experiences from all these different places which you can bring to other countries whereas if you're working with perhaps a local architect who's only ever worked in that one one region there's a bit of a experience gap there as well and, and I, I you know I find it really incredible that you know that you guys have um, you know, moved into 80 different countries internationally and very intelligent to kind of refine your design offering just to that kind of first portion of the, uh, of the, of the design process and then team up with another, another practice. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the, the power of social media, because I mean, my first, uh, encounter with you guys was, um, I think it was the first, first Crescent house, Yes, which I, I, I actually worked on, on that project. <laughs> beautiful project I, I had it stuck up on my uh on my on my wall in my uh bedroom it was like a kind of dream house vision board i had at one point i was like you know and i actually thought that house was in when i first saw it i thought it was in la and then you kind of realized the mountain behind is not what they have in uh los angeles yeah and again that was you know just through browsing on on pinterest and so the kind of photographic imagery that you guys have got of these stunning projects and they're 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 perfect as well like the projects are just sort of you know i, I you know it's not the kind of thing you often get in 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 the west yeah. in you know you know in europe and in uh and the us it's very difficult to get that kind of standard of of design yeah i mean i i think um you know as i said obviously we we're very particular about the kind of curation of our images but but you know touch you're touching on a little, little bit of an interesting subject there and, and i always remember i was i was struck by it the first time I went to Bangkok and, uh, you know, you go to that market and I was, and there's some young kid, like I was a kid at the time, he was making these like amazing tailored shirts. And I just thought they were, and he had this beautifully marketed screen in his business card. And I was like, Jesus, this is just incredible. And then, and then it made me think a little bit about us because, you know, that first Crescent house in the context of that setting and the power of that imagery. And I was just relating it back to this guy who's, you know, so much talent, but he's in this market that I, even if I tried, I would never ever find him again if I went back because it's just like so you know so much so much there. So you know we owe a lot to Cape Town because of that. I think that and and off the back of that, we've been able to then you know have sites in other parts of the world that are just incredible. I mean, I, I still we we constantly pinch ourselves. You know some of the um, some of the positions that we're able to kind mm -hmm. of create architecture in. I mean, it's it, it is incredible. <laughs> It's very interesting because, I mean, would would you um, classify Cape Town and, and kind of South African economy as an emerging market? Would that be a fair? Yeah, it's a touchy subject at the moment. We would we we, <laughs> uh, we would we would like to. Uh, I think probably ten years ago we would have said yes. We're definitely going through a bit of a wobble at the moment, which is um, which is a little bit uh, sad. I think we, you know, obviously coming um, through. The horrendous past that we we've we've had. I think we were sure. we were kind of a little bit of a poster child who was punching above its weight, and everyone was waiting for this expectation that it was just going to take off and and be this kind of model democracy. And and I think you know, sadly, there's there's been a, a few kind of setbacks to that. So I think I think maybe we, we're meant to be, but I think everyone's kind of waiting to see how how it how it sort of plays out. I mean, there's obviously been a lot going on in the world, and we could certainly use sure. some more um, foreign investment. But we, I think, certainly some of the some of the political landscape, we we'll call it, is is kind of made people kind of second guess to to kind of go all in. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a we've got a lot to give. I mean, we've uh, mm -hmm. there's a we really um, we we could do we. Yeah, with some leadership, I think we could be uh, quite an amazing country. Amazing. I mean, it, again, it's it's interesting because there are some of the like the 
the locations of some of your private projects, you know, in in somewhere like Los Angeles or elsewhere in the world, it's it's very very hard to even get that kind of site yeah. nowadays, and to you know, and to also to have a client who's got a, like kind of a modernist taste and wants to finish it like that as well becomes even so that it just makes these projects even more unique, and they're like these kind of gems. Um, and so the sort of the uh, the visual imagery of them are very uh, very seductive and 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 alluring, and I can totally understand how that's how those images have have done the rounds on social media and become a very uh, uh, important pipeline to the to the practice. In 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 terms of uh, working internationally, did you have any uh, like? concerns or did clients have concerns about working internationally so were people finding you online and then set, starting up a relationship and didn't necessarily know how location-based architects normally are how, how did yeah. you kind of reassure yeah people? i mean i think it's uh it's it's still a little bit of a challenge to what we what we do i mean of course you get the clients who want who, who thrive on it you know i want to this is the first set of projects and wherever but um but no, I think we we it it certainly takes a lot of hand holding. I think now with kind of time passed, obviously, uh, again, you know, my ex client model is you know giving referrals and giving them uh, telling them to speak to people. I think I think counts for a lot. Um, I, I think also to some degree, um, the, our model once someone's been through it is actually quite appealing for clients not not all of them realize at first but you know obviously the stress and the ordeal of, of going through a, a new build is is stressful and it's a it's a big commitment and i think what what really compounds that stress is being forced to make a decision under pressure um so the nature of is kind of our model of, of refining and kind of agreeing the design early so that the local architect can then do the kind of construction set everybody is really incentivized to try and you know distill those ideas early and, and up front. So that, that alleviates quite a bit mm. of um, sort of mental uh, headache. It, it is an intensive period and, and we want our clients to, to love it and, and, and make it as enjoyable for them as, as possible. Um, but, it, but it actually, you know, having gone through it, a lot of them find that, that as quite a, quite a successful um, model in terms of engaging it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the it, it is a challenge, and it's a conversation we we have regularly with kind of new inquiries in terms of um, you know how how it gets dealt with. But I think you know once we've explained to them how we work and can kind of also leverage a, a pretty um, respectable portfolio of com, you know completed projects, I think it alleviates a lot of um, a lot of the concerns. I, I, the other thing is, I think you had you asked me this question pre 2020 which again it sounds ridiculous but um you know zoom's changed everything so whether you're chatting to me on this call now or you know often some of those calls with your local architect might also happen on zoom because no one wants to get in their, their car and, and drive i think i think that's made the world feel a, a little bit smaller so um it's not not a big deal um and the other part of it is that um i think we um, we try to limit travel where we where we can, but the reality is that there there is quite a quite a um, amount of it. I mean, I'm probably in the US four times a year or once a quarter or so. Um, so off the back of that, there's still opportunity to meet and engage and really get to know the clients and have a meal with them and um, you know get a feel for things. So so it's it 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 kind of works well. It's um and it's it's not um it's it's not as as uh, scary as it as it might think at the onset that you might think at the onset. Mm -hmm. Um, very uh interesting. You you were saying earlier that the the team has grown um like your your leadership team has grown to now nine people. Mm. Um, how big is the practice and what's the kind of growth that you've seen in the practice since you started sixteen years ago? So I think when I joined 16 years ago, um, it was, I think we were probably in the order of about 60 people. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of uh, grew up to 80. We we um, we had a bit of a delay to the 08 uh, um, issue. In fact, it was the the Dubai um, the Dubai slump that hurt us more. So we kind of went down, right. probably back down to 60. We've been on a pretty um, 
steady growth since then. Um, and we are currently probably on the back of, I'd say, just about on the back of a, of a quite a big growth period. So today we are about 260 people. Um, and maybe just a little segue is, you know, within the we three separate companies, but we call it a kind of group of companies. We also, right. there's, a, there's a, um, an interior design firm called ARC, A-R-R-C-C, and Oka, which is a furniture retailer. So between the three of those companies, um, we are about, I think, 370 odd. Um, right. It's kind of as a broader organization. So we, um, we kind of collaborate, but function separately. I, I personally um, don't play a role in ARC, but some of my fellow principals do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it is a, it is quite a, it, it is, it is a big practice. Um, and, um, and, and it has gone through quite a, quite a significant growth in the, in the, certainly in the time that, uh, that I've been here. Um, yeah. How, 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 how is the office, how is the architectural component of that then structured? So mm. 260 people, that's, you know, that's a, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of people for an architecture practice. We're getting into the, into, into a big realm here. And, yeah. and obviously yeah. the, the processes in the ways of management and leadership, when you were 60 people, I imagine it's got to be pretty different now mm. with, with 260. What, what kinds of, evolutions have you seen and been involved in in terms of creating hierarchy and making sure that leadership is you know it operates well and decision making isn't just sort of spinning spinning indecisively if you like yeah so um i might, I might uh so originally the company was called stefan anthony architects um then greg and philip uh became um partners and the name changed I think it was around 2010 into Sarita, um, which is the SA for Seth and Anthony um, o for Ormsdale, T for Truen. But um, the decision at that point in time um, was made, which I think has been kind of fundamental to us as a practice, was that, you know, I think, and Stefan would say himself, he, he was kind of got exhausted by having to be the person and the name. And, uh, and so the idea was to rather create um, a, a company that was not specific to an, to an individual. Um, but that process and that evolution from Stefan to Greg and Philip is really the model that has kind of continued on. So from, from, from there, um, Philippe became a partner, then myself, um, Logan, who's our financial director, uh, Roxanne. And then, as I mentioned, as of today, um, Danny Remus and Dominic George have, have also become principals. Um, and the structure of the office is that um, Stefan plays, um, for lack of a better word, <laughs> a chairman role because we, we we joke about it. But but that he he is involved in kind of multiple facets across the uh, across the office. Um, Logan, um, our financial director, quite a specific role. Um, and then the remaining um, of us um, head up the architectural team. So it got a little bit complicated today because of the, the the new starts but essentially there up until today there have been um five principal architectural teams those teams range in size from you know 20 to 45 odd people um and we um strategically have tried to align the teams to regions so the the knowledge that right. we learn in a certain place we try to kind of retain that within the team so we don't have a um a residential department and a commercial department and a hospitality department. Um, the the idea is that rather those um, the the region knowledge is retained within the within the team. So um, my my core focus is the US um, and and Caribbean. Um, obviously, dot with um, Dominic joining, we we would be kind of doing that together. And and so in some of the you know Philip, who obviously uh, used to work for, still had, plays a role in in some of those areas as well. But Principally, it's it's region it's region focused. So so in many ways, these those architectural teams kind of function as sort of little studios. So which I think works really well for us because you know we we thrive on on bespoke and unique design. This you know as much as we will be try and create systems and we will if make if it, try and generate efficiency and processes. You know we want to. Do that so that we can focus on 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 the kind of key design elements of, of each project mm -hmm. and kind of make it make it flourish. So, 
<clears throat> so so it, it is this kind of call it a, a, a collection of, of little studios. We, um, from that design point of view, certainly have strategies in place to mention, ensure that kind of a, a level. And when I say consistency, I don't mean it as a um, cookie cutter. I just mean a level of standard and a level of inquiry is done across the across the team. So we've got you know design sessions where, for instance, my team would be presenting this month what what we what we have on the boards and. The rest of the senior management group will sit in in that meeting and, and we all kind of critique it and give it a good bash and give each other, a, 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 um, you know, a, a encouragement, a good encouragement to, to make things better and stronger and, you know, um, and which is, which has been great and, um, and it's something that we, um, we enjoy and, and certainly focus on. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how we manage the, you know, the design aspect of it. So I think in the, in terms of the broader decision making, um, you know, the principal group, um, we, which might sound strange with so many people, but it, it really does function on um, on consensus. I mean, certainly nothing's nothing's plain sailing, and and we, you know, we certainly will have it out on on a couple of things, but we've never had a meeting where it hasn't kind of we we reached a, an, an agreement that it's come down to some sort of voting structure or anything. So I think, I think those, you know, the, those, those discussions are, are good. And I think we are generally very, very closely aligned. And as I say, I can't ever think of, of something that's kind of never been, um, that, that's come to a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, um, impasse. Impasse. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and that, well, that, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And, um, it, the, the, so basically you've got uh, every person has got a region that they're kind of looking at or kind of and the, and the studios and the teams are focused on these individual and these regions are international regions yes uh, um, i mean bro broad broad strokes it's the u.s and caribbean it's mexico and south america it's upcontinent africa europe middle east and then it's kind of southeast asia and australia um so we also we, we try and you know, manage the, the time zones you have to work in, the trips you have to make. Um, I mean, there's a lot of efficiencies in terms of doing it that way. I mean, the, the one other, other thing which, um, you know, I think is what is one of the greatest things we have in terms of our kind of spread is is from a, you know, somewhere, um, you know, Greg always tells the story is, you know, Lagos was one of our strongest markets at a point in time. Oil price fell through the floor. It ended. Los Angeles blew up. So, so we've we've kind of got these, and, and you know, we've seen we've seen that happening now. Certainly, Florida and Dubai have been incredibly strong over the last kind of three years. Um, mm. Florida has kind of started to taper off. Dubai is still strong, but you know that that influences those regions somewhat, as because some of the teams might not have the influx of work that others have, and so you you might end up um, that you you know pick up a job to. Um, where, where other teams are, are taking strain and, um, and we do generally retain clients. So there is the odd occasion where, um, where a client might be, um, you know, building something in, in Europe that we've worked with before and that relationship's important. So we would, um, you know, we would, we, the team would kind of retain that, um, would retain that relationship. What, what does it take to be a director? Or a partner of a firm, because I, I I I think this is really interesting to to consider because it's not for everybody. Yeah, um, one of our challenges, I guess, is is the you know it is it is a demanding environment. I think also even in just in just this explanation of how we work, uh, mm. generally you need to be quite uh, all rounder because you know I my role in terms of managing my team is. You know, managing a, a sizable team. I'm also, you know, often um, and, and look, I'm not discounting because we have a very strong upper management group who do a lot of this, a lot of the kind of onboarding exercises as well, and owning the client relationships. But you, you know, you 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 need to be able to have a strong management aspect. You need to have a design eye because a lot of the way we the the leadership in the office, a lot of that is actually done through the design, and because that's what we do. You know your leadership with your clients is also you need to be able to be the one in that meeting who can 
come up with the idea that no one else has thought of on the spot and, and, and make this. So, so it's, it's, it is quite a demanding role in, in this office because we don't have the kind of, the kind of partition roles per se. Um, but I, I think, I think the, so, but, but also I, I think it's a big, a big part of it is the, is, is the, is the people aspect. And, and I don't mean that in terms of general sense because I think if you're a great designer, you can lead through that design and people through that. You don't have to be the friendliest person at the table, but as long as people recognize, you know, what you, what you can do. And of course we can also, because we have the teams we do, you know, you, you could potentially supplement some of those, those personalities if, if need be to kind of mm-hmm. build a, um, and leverage a, a, those kind of, um, uh, relationships and if there, if there are any, um, kind of roles or aspects that need to be supplemented. Do, do, do you as directors, are you involved in the, the winning of work or is that like, do you have like your own marketing team and a sale and like sales teams, people who are like full-time allocated to that work, to that task or does that split amongst the directors? So, so, so this, this is, is kind of what I was getting with the, with our, how important our imagery is, is you know, we, we don't have a sales, we don't have a sales team. We, we really rely on that to generate work or, or for us to kind of leverage the relationships that we, that we have. So off the back of that, we get a lot of inquiries that, that come into the office. Um, that is then kind of received based on the region by, you know, myself and the, and the senior management within my team. Um, and then we would, we would engage, we would engage with them. Um, so yeah, we are very active in that, in that role of kind of call it securing work, um, and, and generating, but, but it, it, the, the work is kind of self-generated, I guess, of the, um, the content that we, you know, that we, um, that we, that we market. And, and when a inquiry comes into the office, how, how is it allocated to a particular director or a particular team i guess it's it's kind of regionally focused region region based on the region correct yeah great great and and in 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 terms of the 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 kind of business skills that are needed so you know the, the identification of systems the understanding finance hr are all of these things they have their own separate teams within the office or again does the directors need to have some kind of understanding of of how those processes operate uh, we have um, we have great people in all of those departments, um, but the directors are certainly um, extremely involved in, in in all of those aspects. I think um, you know I've said the word a few times, but it's taken years to refine it, and they continue to evolve. But you know, Logan, our FD, is an incredible suite of documents that she's kind of been able to refine that allows us to kind of see where we stand kind of financially what's the forecast looking like it really enables us to to make decisions on a kind of ongoing um ongoing basis and you know that even gets filtered down into the senior management of the team in terms of how how are the projects performing is everything as we expected it to be um you know uh, so so we are extremely involved um in, in in all of those aspects i think um Certainly, the HR team um, supports us very well, but um, but it's it's still a fairly direct relationship in, in with all of the well, not fairly. It is a very direct relationship with everybody, kind of um, in the in the studio and the and mm-hmm. the teams. How does financial information get communicated across the the business? Um, I mean, I, I speak to a lot of um, kind of larger firms who usually nowadays, most firms are kind of um, quite transparent with their financials and might do a quarterly presentation to the rest of the team to sort of show things like profit and loss statements and their balance sheets and, um, you know, how they're, how well you're progressing towards a kind of financial series of, of targets just so the rest of the, the the business understand what's going on and also from a project manager's perspective you know they need to know what the budgets are on projects with fees how, how do you guys manage the conversation around finance beyond the immediate directors so we have um or uh, what well, happens at a, at a at a couple of levels so we um we have a, a sort of when I refer to the senior management group, it's we refer to it as the pass group, which is the principals, associates, and, and senior staff group. <clears throat> and um, so we have a sort of 
think it's probably um, twice a year we would have a kind of overall report of kind of you know how we've done, how we're doing, what's the forecast um, looking like. It's it's uh, it's in fairly fairly general terms, but but I mean, kind of gives a very good sense of of where we where we at. And then we have a monthly meeting, uh, kind of just pre invoices being sent out with the those past members in each of the in each of the teams. And there um, we would go through um, very specifically um, everybody's projects. And you know, each of the each of the in my team, for example, I've kind of got. Uh, five people in that in that group and they've all got their projects and you know we've set targets for the year and we can monitor um how those projects are going we were forecast to in, do a certain invoice by you know this this month is it ready to go why can't it go you know so so they are extremely involved in their in their specific projects and and certainly in that meeting we would touch on a kind of little bit of a litmus test of how the kind of broader office is, is doing. Um, right. And so there's, in terms of those, those targets, I think it's, it's fairly kind of, you know, clear in terms of what the, you know, what the expectations are and what those numbers sort of represent. Um, so it's, it's fairly, it's fairly transparent. I mean, I wouldn't say it's in, entirely, but I think that cool. it would have a very good understanding of, um, of kind of where, where things stand. In, in terms of becoming a director in the, in the business and perhaps you can relate to your own personal experience, what, what was that career trajectory like? Was it something that you decided upon earlier on that you wanted to be a director and you started to make that known or were you kind of identified and cultivated and nurtured for directorship position? And if so, um, what do you think it was about yourself that that led to that? Um, I think that uh, certainly when I, when I joined, I don't, I definitely did not join thinking that this would be my, my career. And to Mm -hmm. be fair, the business was not what it is today. It was still an impressive outfit, but it wasn't what it it is today. Um, Yeah. I kind of thought that I'd be here for, you know, two to five years. And then I kind of had, dreams of going to pursue a master's in, in Columbia, New York. And I, I don't yeah. know, and then I'd come back and start my own, my own practice. Um, but, you know, the, as I, I, as I was then, uh, um, you know, I was, I was I clearly was identified. I think I was fairly well kind of looked after and, um, and I could, and then really what, what was a big change for me was that, um, that work in the U S that kind of, almost came out of out of nowhere it was i i could recognize at that point that i could take this somewhere and i could be someone in the in in the firm um and so probably three or four years into that i i really sort of felt that i was i mean at the point at that point in time i was probably in you know early 30s and kind of trying to work out and you know, when I thought about it and I looked left and right, I, you know, I was like, this, you know, this is, this could really, this could really go somewhere. And so I, I kind of grabbed those opportunities and, and ran with it. So I think it's a bit of both. I think I, I put my hand up and I think it was noticed. And, um, um, and I think that, you know, that, that, that certainly helped a lot. I mean, in terms of my personal strengths, I think, um, I think it is probably, a bit of the all-roundedness that I, that I um, I think I think helps. I, I think it's you know it is those qualities of being an all-rounder, being a decent manager, being good at design, um, and 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 I think really having the work ethic and and sort of ambition and kind of drive that people can recognize that you can you know maybe uh, really sort of contribute. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's probably <laughs> probably how it happened. I mean, at the same time, I I count myself very lucky that I felt my, found myself in that in that position. But I I think um, I I think I subconsciously that that was the opportunity I was I was looking for and, and was able to take it. Mm, amazing. And and now when you're kind of looking at the sort of next generation of partners and leaders in the firm, what do you look for? 
um with with for, for team members and and how do you kind of nurture that talent or how or in general how do you kind of retain talent so that they stick around and help them develop career pathways is that a formalized process or what does it look like yeah it's something we we, we obviously spinning um a lot of what well, we spend a lot of time um discussing it because we've got incredibly talented people within the, within the office and obviously this you know post 2020 with the the way things work we we you know people are, are are looking around and it's not always easy to to retain people um i think also the obviously the the, the growth of the of the business has potentially opened opportunities for for more people in in leadership in, in leadership roles um and i think the the in terms of a Formal process. I, I, I mean, I think the path is set, and I, I still maintain that you know that very original model is there and is still what we what we're running today, and um, and, and we we we're very open to it. And I think you know if you again you know put your hand up and can prove that you can you know function independently and are um, are willing and capable to, capable to do it, we we are very happy to kind of facilitate it and make room and. You know, provide the 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 support and 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 uh, and, um, and and backup that that someone might need to kind of take that to take that next step. I mean, I, I think we also you know talk a lot about trying to um, you know potentially find other areas of the business. You know, we've we've been in this kind of growth cycle where you know we we maybe need to look at the global area and could potentially get some specialists in certain. Um, certain roles to kind of help take us to the to the next mm -hmm. level. So, <clears throat> but again, even in that, I think we, you know, also feel that the right person will 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 kind of make that make that step happen happen for us. Although you know, we obviously trying to create the framework that 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 could still happen. Um, but yeah, very very important to us is is that is obviously the kind of longevity of the business and and how we can. Um, yeah, I think we've always been a we've always been a fairly young practice, and and we we want to make sure that that is still very much at the kind of um, core of our, our, our DNA. And I, I don't I don't mean that really only on an age point of view, but I, I think just in terms of what the kind of general experience and the and more the kind of um, personality of the of the and culture of the office that we that we want to maintain. So. Um, we know we we know it's important, and I think you know this announcement today. I think is kind of further um, further yeah. news to that that we we um, that we we open to it and and want to make it want to make it happen for those that are are capable. Do, do you have a lot of um, international talent, or is it all homegrown South African Cape Town architects? <clears throat> so. Um, <laughs> A couple of a couple of challenges to that. We do have some. We do have some international. Um, one of the one of the challenges to that is, you know, working in South Africa. We have a horrendous unemployment rate, so it is extremely mm -hmm. difficult for foreigners to get um, uh, to get work permits to to work here. Having right. said that, you know, post COVID, we are. Um, uh, I say hybrid, but we we all work from home. We we have a beautiful office which. Um, is open for anyone that wants to be here, but the majority of, of people are working from home. So that, that certainly has opened the door to, um, which has been wonderful for our growth because now we can employ specifically, well, we, technically people from anywhere, but we've been able to employ great people in Johannesburg or Pretoria or, or mm -hmm. KwaZulu-Natal or many other South African centers, which has been um, great for us. Um, and so we do have some internationals, but, um, you know, the, the other the other problem is when you when you look at what you can af afford in South Africa, um, it's a, quite difficult to justify um, you know a foreign um, a foreign sal salary. Um, yeah. But you know if we can if we can make it work, we we certainly um, are open to it. It's just it, it there's always a couple of challenges that that tend to surround it. Have you ever considered having international offices? Uh, it's interesting because you, you know the, the structure is you've got the kind of the teams are already set up by region. Mm -hmm. Has it has it um, has it ever been a discussion to kind of actually go and set offices up in different countries, which is what most other well a lot of practices do. 
So I'm laughing because it's something we probably talk about every every three months. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's certainly something that we look at. the The honest answer is that um, our our model, as it is, is so sound that it's quite yeah. it, it's almost impossible to justify um, to justify those kind of foreign entities. We we've tried. Yeah. We tried once in in Dubai. I mean, even locally, we tried, uh, but but they've never really worked. I think so. But at the same time, it, we we do talk about it a lot, and it's definitely we would never rule it out because I think you know we we do would would like to make it work, and you know there are things we we constantly ask ourselves is you know what are we missing out on by by not being there? Because when you look at the model as it stands today opening that foreign business is, is kind of just going to hurt what we have here. So it's very, it's a very difficult thing to, um, to justify. Um, but, uh, we certainly won't, wouldn't, wouldn't rule it out. I think it's, um, a, a, at some point we, I'm sure we'll find a way to make, to get it to work, but it's <laughs> for some reason way harder than, uh, than you might think. Amazing. Brilliant. What does the rest of uh, 2023 have in store for you? And, and what are you looking forward to in the, in the upcoming years? Um, so yeah, things are looking, things are looking fairly good. I mean, my, my side of the office in the U S is, um, it's probably been a little bit quieter than normal for the past few months, but seem to be picking up a little bit now. Um, we're optimistic that, um, China might be kind of starting to, Fire again, although it seemed like it would, and then it's kind of slowed a little. But um, we've got a couple of projects kicking off there now, and so that's potentially over the next little while. You know, all of that pent up, uh, uh, all those pent up projects that never that kind of got shelved might um, might start to um, surface again. Um, so yeah, it's looking it's 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 looking pretty pretty good. I think the other. Um, sides of the office we were quite busy in india at the moment middle east is still busy um so it's it's looking like it should be a, another good year amazing brilliant well that's the perfect place to to conclude the conversation mark that's been absolutely fascinating to hear about a little bit a little peek behind the scenes at sayota um, and to hear about your your own personal career trajectory and all the amazing stuff you guys are doing. So I really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>